excited that um, we have a very special guest speaker today. Um, Michael Ramsden is, uh, you can count on one hand how many astonishing anointed evangelists and apologists are in the world today. And um, he doesn't quite make that hand, but um, of course he does. He is one of the top two evangelists in the world. He works for Ravi Zacharias. Um, he's been trained up by Ravi. He's an astonishing speaker. He speaks to presidents, prime ministers, kings, queens, students, uh, uh, business people, ordinary folk like me, everybody. And he travels around the world, hugely busy. But you know what? That's not the primary reason. I'm excited he's here today. Sarah and I have been good friends with Michael and his wife Anne for 22 years and um, we're godparents to each other's children and he's a confidant, a friend, uh, I go to him for advice. We just love him and his family. That's why I'm excited that he's here today and uh, he's going to be preaching in this service and then um, uh, at the end of the service you can go and grab a quick by the lunch at Hutong or wherever, and then at 2 p.m. in here, he's going to do uh, uh, a seminar. We'll try to keep it to one hour where he'll speak, and then we'll have questions and answers. And the topic for the seminar is on, uh, let's, get, let's get this right, money, love, and happiness, which to me sounds like a Chinese New Year song. <laughs> so I'm, I'm hoping uh, Michael might deliver the seminar in Cantonese, but we'll see. Um, but would you give a really heartfelt family welcome to Michael as he comes to speak to us now. Thank you, Miles. Well, you know, it really is a joy to be able to be here. And um, I've wanting to be uh, to come to speak here for a while. When Miles and Sarah first moved here, we, my wife and I, we were very excited at the possibility and all we felt God was going to do. And at the same time, very sad, too, to lose two such good friends who are now moving so far away. And so we've, we've been hearing what's been happening here over the years, and it's encouraged and blessed us. And um, I can tell I'm in you know, the right part of the world. You serve your, your, your coffee in red cups, and maybe if I have notes at the end of my seminar, we'll hand them out in red envelopes uh, since it's Chinese New Year. Um, but it's just amazing to be here, uh, and I've just simply been blessed by, by just simply being part of what's already happened this morning. Now this afternoon, what I'll be talking about is about some of the things we pursue. But what I'd love to talk about this morning with you is what actually drives us. What is one of the primary motivating things that should drive and inform every single thing that we do and indeed who we are? Now, we live in a world where we tend to talk a lot about a lot of things, but we never necessarily always stop to think about it in enough depth. And so one of the subject matters I'm going to look at you uh, this morning is, in one sense, a very simple one, but at the same time, very, very profound. Because we'll be looking at the idea of love. Now, there was a very interesting book written, I can't remember if it was last year or maybe just before, by a um, Greek guy called Paul Kalanithi. And in it, he's talked about and quoted Socrates, who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. But then he went on to say something very interesting. He asked a question. If the unexamined life is not worth living, does that mean that the unlived life is not worth examining? Did you hear the question? If the unexamined life is not worth living, does that mean the unlived life is not worth examining? And one of the primary questions we ask ourselves in our life is what is it that actually makes all of this worthwhile in the first place? What is it that actually informs us? Many of us sometimes in life we choose to live on the edge looking for some kind of thrill you know, to fill us, to, 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 to make everything worthwhile. So we're constantly looking in some form of activism or some kind of experience, something that actually helps pull everything together. And that's because it's one thing to talk about meaning in life, it's another thing to experience in it. Experience it. So we're, we're looking for something that will fill us in that deep way. But so often we, we get the questions wrong. And we, we, even, we, we don't even spend enough time even sometimes thinking about what these words even mean. I, um, I was speaking at one of the uh, la oldest uh, merchant banks in the United Kingdom a um, couple of uh, years, uh, about a few years ago, and I was asked to speak to the board, and I was very thrilled because this bank has its own restaurant with a very famous chef in it, and I was just looking forward even more than meeting the board to trying their lunch. And uh, after I'd finished speaking and uh, we'd had this amazing lunch together, the questions started coming out. 
And after I'd finished speaking, one of the guys who was there said, Michael, I'd like to share with you a, a story, that, a true story happened to my, my friend a few weeks ago. And he said, you know, my, this uh, friend of mine, his son applied to study at one of the most um, prestigious schools in the United Kingdom. And the way you gain entrance to the school is the headmaster interviews every boy. And the father has to come with the son to the interview. But the way it's set up is the headmaster sits on one side of the desk, the boy sits on the other side of the desk facing the headmaster, and the father sits behind the son. So the son, father is in the room, but all he can see is the back of his son's head. So we can't give him any clues, any guidance, any help. But he gets to hear the whole interview. And the interview seems to be going very well, and then the headmaster asked this boy a question. It's quite a profound question. He said, tell me, what is it in life that scares you the most? That's an interesting question. And the boy thought for a moment, and then he said, oblivion. Now, the father was surprised by this answer. Now, oblivion, like all words, it has shades of meaning. It can mean to cease to exist. It can mean to continue to exist, but to be forgotten in everyone else's mind. That's what politicians live in fear of. <laughs> it, but whatever it is, it's not good. And the headmaster was visibly surprised by the profundity of this answer. You could see it. He was shocked. And very quickly, he wrapped up the interview and awarded this boy, 12-year-old boy, a place at the school. And now as the father's driving his son back, he's not celebrating my son got into the school he did so well. He's worried. My son lives in terror of oblivion. And as they're driving back down the motorway, he finally summons up enough courage to ask himself the question he's been dying to ask for the last hour and a half. And as calmly as he can, he says to his son, you know when the headmaster asked you what it scares you the most? You said oblivion. Why? He said, well, why did you say that? And the little boy looked at the father with a funny expression on his face and said, well, that was the name of the very scary ride at the fun fair we went to last, last week. <laughs> now, you see what happened. The, the headmaster detected a profundity in that 12-year-old boy's answer that actually wasn't there. <laughs> and so often we're, we're using words all the time, but we, we haven't wrestled sufficiently with to ask what they really mean. What, what does this actually mean? And at times we feel we may even be talking about the same thing, but we're talking about very different things. And that's how very often it is as we come to God's word and actually read what is it that he has for us? What is he saying to us in this in this? Uh, in his word to us. And so we, we find ourselves then wrestling, asking these very complex and difficult questions and trying to look for that kind of insight that's going, to, that's going to inform us. But this question about what is it that motivates us, rather than simply what we simply pursue, what is it that motivates us is, is actually very important. And I'd like to read some words, if I can, out of um, the Bible. Um, it comes from a very well-known chapter in some circles, 1 Corinthians 13. And it says something which I sometimes skip over. If you're familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, it's very often quoted sometimes at weddings, it's, it's quoted all, all over the place. And there's this beautiful list that comes after the first, these words I'm about to read to you. Love is patient, love is kind, and all this kind of stuff. And I've, I've been reading this, I read this, read through the Bible every year. I've been doing that for, for many years. I, I don't know how many times I've read this passage. But it was only recently that I realized I'd never paid enough attention to the first part of what it says. It says this, if I speak in the tongues of angels, or, or the tongues of men, and even angels, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I, if I, um, I'm only a resounding gong or clang, oh, no, oh, no. if I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge. And if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. Now that's incredible. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, here's what's interesting about this. What I've realized for a lot of my life is I've made an assumption which is wrong. And we've, we talk about people like this all the time. We say something like this, Wow, they're such a spiritual person. They're so gifted. They're so, they're so incredible. They, 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 just, they, they don't love a lot. And we excuse the lack of love by the giftedness, the spiritual giftedness that they have. Does that make sense? And we think, you know what? They've got 90% of it. And if they just added in this 10% of love, then, then, then it would make it complete. 
Or we sometimes look at people's generosity and we, we say, gosh, you know, they give so much and they're so generous and you know, whatever, but they're, they're a difficult person to get along with and we feel that they're, they've got so much of it right. They're like 80% of the way there and if they just add this last 20% of love, then all of a sudden it makes everything okay. Or sometimes we think, gosh, they're brilliant. They're so clever. They, they understand so much. They have so much knowledge. They have so much insight. But they're difficult to get along with, and they're, you know, they're a bit they're dismissive of other people. They don't treat them with respect. And we think, gosh, they have 80, 90% of so much, and just add in. If we could just add in that last missing 10% of love, then that sorts out everything. But actually, this isn't what's being said here at all. What's being said here is actually way more profound. It says no matter how spiritually gifted you are, no matter how much spiritual, example, uh, spiritual power or experience you may have had, if you do not have love at the center of your life and it drives and informs everything else, it's nothing. If you have wisdom and insight and understanding unlike almost anyone else before you, but love is absent, you are nothing, not, not 80%, zero. If you give everything, even your body, even if you sacrifice yourself in the service of others, but that is not informed and motivated by love, it, it means nothing. It comes to nothing. It amounts to nothing. Now, that's, that's incredible in this day and age. A little while ago, I was um, listening to a, uh, a song by a group called Extreme. I don't know how many of you are familiar with them. They're quite new. As you can see, I, I, I live on the cutting edge of fashion <laughs> and culture. And so... Forgive me if these words are too contemporary for you. It's, it's not a classic yet, but, but listen to what they say. It's, it's incredible. Saying I love you are not the words I want to hear from you. It's not that I don't want you not to say it, but if you only knew how easy it would be to show me how you feel, more than words is all you have to do to show me it is real. Then you wouldn't have to say that you love me because I would know it already. What would you do if my heart was torn in two? More than words to show your feel that your love for me is real. What would you say if I took those words away? Then you couldn't make things new just by saying, I love you. Do you see what they're saying? They're saying, I want to know that you love me. I want to hear those words, but I don't want you to speak them. I need to know this is real. I need to see it in your life. What would you do if I took those words away, they're saying? What happens if you couldn't say that phrase, I love you? If I took those words away from you so you could no longer use them, what would you do? How would you show me that you actually really love me? How would I know this is real? And this pursuit, not just in terms of what motivates us in terms of love, but also the pursuit of love itself is critical for us. Because the words come very easily. The question is, it needs to be just so much more than that if, if love is going to be experienced as well as just defined. So we're, we're, we're dealing here with some very, very, very deep questions. Now the trouble is, is that normally when we talk about ethics, and I, I, I used to teach ethics at university, you, you have to forgive me, I, I, uh, for a while I taught moral philosophy and, and sort of ethics at university. I, I've always maintained that teaching logic and philosophy at university is the secular equivalent of speaking in tongues. The, <laughs> The primary difference is that when you teach philosophy, even angels can't understand <laughs> what you're saying. And when we teach ethics, in most systems of the world, there's, there's, we, we, we make a, 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 a distinction, sometimes consciously, sometimes subconsciously, and it goes like this. If, if you sh there are things that you should do. And it, it, it has value, it's good. It's good that you want to help other people. But if you really enjoy helping other people, does that make sense? If you love helping other people, if you enjoy helping other people, it, it fulfills you, it makes you happy to help other people. It's not really, it doesn't have real moral value. Does that make sense? You're only doing what you want to do. But if you hate other people, you can't stand them. A few, a few people laughed at that point, so we'll, <laughs> we'll have prayer ministry at the end. But, but if you hate other people, you just can't, you don't want anything to do with people but you go and help them, well, well now, now what you do, it has value. Does that make sense? Real moral value, real ethical value lies when we do the things we don't want to do. That's what really counts. And so many ethical systems around the world, whether it's secularly defined or religiously defined, have at their core some kind of assumption like that. There are things that you don't want to do, but you should do them, and then it has real value. But actually, the Bible teaches the complete reverse of that. 
It teaches the opposite. It teaches if you give and it's not motivated by love and joy, you need to examine your heart. It claims if you're pursuing knowledge and you want to learn the right thing and learn how to act, but it's not motivated by love, it doesn't mean anything. It is actually a reversal of the basis of almost all global ethics. It's, it's, it's incredible. Now, the reason why we think this way is we very often think, but yes, but that's like self-giving, isn't it? Self-giving means you, you doing not what you want. And, and, and that sort of misunderstands the very nature of love. Several years ago, I remember reading a book by a Christian theologian. He made a very powerful point that stayed with me now for years. But just, a, a, I'd like you to imagine the, the following with me. You see, that what we're basically saying is, that what we assume is, look, when I do something, I don't want to do it. That, that's real love. That's real ethics. That has real value. But, but that, as I say, it, I can't stress how, so too strongly how, how wrong it is to think that way. The, the argument goes a bit like this. Look, Michael, when you do something you don't want to do, it shows how selfless you are. Does that make sense? That's selfless. But when you do something that you delight in, you love it, it's, it's, it's more selfish. Does that make sense? We're motivated by ourselves. It makes everything very selfish. But that, that's, that's, that's simply not right. It's more than duty. It, what the theologian said, he asked this question. He said, Imagine a husband asked his wife, must I kiss you goodnight each night? He said, imagine if that question were asked, what would she say? Now this theologian philosopher said, she would say, unless a spontaneous affection for your person motivates me, your overtures are stripped of moral beauty. <laughs> now, personally, I think she'll just give him a slap, but he was a philosopher, so you know, he thinks that way. She's saying, look, it shouldn't be because you feel you have to. It's not that kind of have to. Does that make sense? Must I kiss you goodnight each night? You must, but it's a different type of must. It's a different type of compulsion I'm looking for. Uh, I, I do a lot of travel, and I, I'm, I'm away a lot, and I know my wife loves flowers. It's, it's one of the things that I know she, she, she loves having flowers in the house. And there's a florist at the top of the road. They know me pretty well, and very often when I come home, I, I buy her flowers. And they're supposing one day I'm, you know, I've been away. I come back after this trip because this is a, quite a long trip for me. We were just yesterday we were in Hong Kong for 24 hours, now I'm here for 24 hours, tomorrow I'm in Singapore for 24 hours, then I'm in Jakarta for 24 hours, and then I'm back in Hong Kong for 12 hours to go back home to be home for 24 hours before I go to Cambridge. And so, you know, there's a lot of travel going on, and I've just been actually in California on the west coast of the States before I came here, so I'm not sure if I'm here or somewhere else, but I think I am here. <laughs> but I, I often go to, suppose I've been to the florist, and I, I, I come back home, and I, I knock on the front door when I get home on Thursday morning, and my wife opens the door, and as she opens the door, I produce some flowers from behind my back, and I go, ta-da, <laughs> these are for you. And she looks at them, and she says, Michael, they're, they're beautiful. What, what, you shouldn't have done it. Why did you do it? And I say, it was my duty. <laughs> There's something profoundly deficient in that answer. <laughs> you see, yes, we can talk about duty. There is duty, but there's also a sense of duty that has no honor in it if it's stripped of joy, if it's stripped of love. There's no honor to my wife, there's no honor to my country, there's no honor to my church, there's no honor to my God if my service for him is just simply a question of duty. It's also a question of joy. Is this the primary thing that I, that I want to do? Now, as I say, we struggle with it because we think this is very selfish. It's such a selfish way of thinking. So let's just back up again. Uh, I've been away. I buy the flowers. I knock on the door. It's our 25th wedding anniversary this year. We'll be celebrating 25 years together. And so let's suppose I get back and I thank you and I knock on the door and my wife opens them and I've got the most enormous bunch of flowers. And she, she takes them and she says, Michael, why did you buy so many flowers? And I say, because I know how happy it makes you feel. We're celebrating our 25th wedding anniversary this year, and I just wanted to give these to you because I knew it, it gives me so much joy to see your, the, fa the expression on your face when you receive them. And as a matter of fact, I've, I've arranged a babysitter tonight, and I've booked your favorite restaurant, and we're going to go out for dinner because there's nothing I would rather do. There's no one I'd rather be with right now than you. When I say that to her, Anne never looks at me and says, what do you mean there's nothing you would rather do? Why don't you think about me sometime? How can you be so selfish? She, she doesn't say that because it's the nature of love to delight yourself in the other. 
That's the sign of a healthy, loving, living relationship that you delight in the other. When that is no longer the case, something's gone wrong. And God isn't simply asking some kind of duty from us. He's looking for a joy. We've been singing about it all morning. You may have noticed that. That we dance with joy, that we celebrate with joy, that we live with joy, that we want to honor with our lives the love that's been poured out to cast out the shadows from our soul. We, we've been singing about that all morning. It's th that's what love really looks like. That's how love is actually defined in the Bible. Which is why when you read those verses in 1 Corinthians, they are actually utterly so profound, we can't possibly gloss them over. It is saying that love has to be the primary driving factor in our pursuit of knowledge, in our pursuit of relationship, in our worship, in our life, in our living, in our giving. Do you know a love like that? Do you know a love that is so all-encompassing, all-involving, that it just takes up every single aspect of, of who you are? Because that's the kind of love that Jesus Christ offers us through the cross. It's the most incredible thing. In 18, it's, it, this love, it, it, changes, it changes nations. In 1822, a, a statue was erected in London, a statue of the Greek god Achilles. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Achilles, very muscular, well-built. I'm actually half Greek. I, I grew up in the Middle East and Saudi Arabia, but my mother is uh, from Cyprus. And, you know, Greeks, we're, we're sort of split in half genetically. One half looked like the Greek gods, six-pack muscles. The other, us are built, other half are built like Greek restaurants. <laughs> and uh, m my genes are from the restaurant side of that genetic <laughs> tree. And the, this statue, as it was erected in the city of London, it caused an uproar. I mean, there was literally a public outcry, a national outcry, because the statue was naked. And so they made a giant fig leaf out of concrete, and they stuck it onto the front of the statue. Now, you may listen to that story and think, wow, that, isn't that a bit strange that people would be so sensitive to that? But you, there's something that makes that story even more surprising. If you go online and Google and you ask for pictures, drawings of London, life in London, as it was in the late 1700s, you'll be shocked by what you see. Because there was public nudity in the streets. You'll see pictures of people throwing up in the streets. You'll see pictures of people having sex in public, in the streets, in the hours of daylight. So there's an even bigger question, an even more amazing question to ask, and it's this. How on earth did the city of London which in the late 1700s wasn't even bothered by sex in public. By 1822, how come the very idea of a naked statue caused outrage? What was the revolution that happened in the country to move it so far from one to another? And the answer is actually very simple. It was the love of Christ. Because in the late 1700s, there was a huge spiritual awakening. And now all of a sudden, this very secular country fell in love with Jesus all over again. And when they fell in love with Jesus, everything changed. The whole nation changed. Laws were changed. There's a guy, a very famous guy, who lived about that time called Lord Shaftesbury. Lord Shaftesbury was a very privileged, powerful, rich young man. And when he encountered Jesus Christ, his entire life changed. He now wanted to live and help other people. He's sometimes referred to as the father of modern day childhood. He argued that children, young children, shouldn't be sent to work in labor, that they should go to school. So he set up free schooling. And he got the laws changed. He argued that there should be access to health care. So not only did he get hospitals set up, but he got the government to make sure that it could be available to people. He literally changed the legal and social landscape of Great Britain. And when he died, they erected a statue. Now, this statue it, it still stands in a different part of London today. It's in Piccadilly Square. It's a statue that most people have no idea what it is. They, they, all kinds of tourists go to London. If you go online, you'll see thousands of pictures of this statue. People have their picture taken in front of it. They've got no idea what they're taking a picture of. They, they, they think they're taking a picture of the statue Eros. Eros is the Greek you know, goddess for love. And the reason they think it's Eros is it's a statue of a fat cherub, little angel with wings and a bow and arrow. And that's normally how Eros is, is defined. Does that make sense? Eros is, you know, depicted. But actually, it's not a statue of Eros. That statue is the statue of Anteros. Eros is little, lesser known brother, twin brother, actually. 
Now, anteros is the opposite of eros. Okay, that's why you have Antarctica, Antarctica. Okay, Antarctica. They went there and they discovered bears, and then they found the other pole, and there were no bears. It was called Antarctica. Okay, no bears. So, anteros is the opposite of eros. Eros is a love that likes to consume. Eros is a way of life that gets pleasure by consuming others. So you see it in pornography. You can reduce someone else to an object and you consume them for your own pleasure and satisfaction. That's the relationship between you and an object. You consume the object to meet your own need. And so much of our modern day love has been reduced into that. But real love isn't about consumption, it's about connection. It's about building a relationship with another person. And it's self-giving. It's incredible. And that's why when Lord Shaftesbury died, they wanted to erect a statue in his honor. And they didn't want to have a statue of him. They felt that would be very narcissistic. So instead, they erected a statue of Anteros to represent selfless, self-giving love. The official name of that statue is the Angel of Christian Charity. It was there to remind everybody what he had done, the love he had for people, the love he had for his nation, how he poured himself out and literally saw the whole country change. As a matter of fact, there were many other people around him as well. They were all part of that movement and it completely changed the landscape of England. It turned it from one type of country to another. God is able to change a nation as well as a heart when we encounter his love and we learn to pour it out. Love is meant to be the driving factor and at the heart of everything that we do. Now the question is, this seems awfully big. H how is it possible to live this way? And the answer to that lies in seeing how Jesus Christ loved us. When I was about three years old, I was, um, oh, I think I was two years old, I was, my mother had me on a little picnic and I was playing by some water and for a couple of seconds, about two, three seconds, she was distracted and she looked away, she was talking to somebody, and I fell into the water, and I disappeared under the surface. Now, a friend of hers happened to be in the same park at the same time, and as she was walking along, she saw me fall into the water. And she started sprinting along the edge, and then she suddenly went down into the water and pulled me out from underneath, and then went back and restored me to my mother. I remember the first time I met her, I was very casual about meeting her, I had no, I had, because I didn't know the story. My mother introduced me and they said, this is so and so, and I was like, hi, and then walked out the room. But afterwards, when my mother told me the story, I asked her if she would invite her back again, because I wanted to meet the woman who saved my life. God's love for us is so strong, he sent his son Jesus Christ into this world to rescue us, to save us. He reached down into our life when we are broken and empty with a hand of salvation and he pulls us out from the water. And when you realize the lengths to which Jesus Christ has gone to rescue you, you cannot but help fall deeply in love with him. It changes everything. It changes the way you think about him. And in this particular rescue, it's not like the woman who just came down, put down her arm and pulled me up. Jesus Christ's rescue demanded his death. He was willing to die for us. He came into this world and laid down his life that we may be rescued and pulled out from his. And when you fall in love with him, you will find that the chains in your life are broken. When you fall deeply, desperately in love with somebody, you don't have to think, worry about falling in love with someone else. Does that make sense? I don't know if you've ever been so in love that no matter what else comes, it's easy to resist temptation because you are completely, totally, and utterly in love. It just expels everything else around it. You've just got no time for it because you're just so in love. It's the most incredible thing. And when you realize how much Jesus Christ has done for you and what happened on the cross, you can't help but fall in love with him. And then it simply changes the way you live from that point on. It's the most changing and transforming thing you can possibly know and it utterly revolutionizes your life. And that's what happened to the guy who wrote 1 Corinthians. 
The guy who wrote this was a man who hated Christians and wanted to kill them. But when he met Jesus Christ, his life was completely changed. And now he's willing to give his life in service for everybody else. It changes everything. A couple of months ago, I was speaking in northern Nigeria in a city called Jos. Some of you will be familiar with it. That part of the world became very famous a few years ago when 274 schoolgirls were kidnapped there and there was a huge story about it. And while I was there, I, we, we, well, we met with one of the groups that was responsible for the kidnapping, but that's a whole other story. But the thing that amazed me was the guy I was spending time with. His name is Archbishop Benjamin Kawashi. His wife is a woman, amazing woman by the name of Gloria. When Archbishop Ben Kawashi went on an overseas trip about 15 years ago to go and speak at a big conference, when he came back, there were 12 children sitting around his dining room table, which was not unusual. They fed a lot of children in their home. But as it was getting dark, he said to his wife, we need to send the children home because it's, it's dangerous out there. It's not safe. They need to get home before it's dark. And Gloria looked at Ben and said, they are home. And Ben said, what do you mean? And she said, Ben, these children were going to die, so while you're away, I adopted them. They're our children. And he looked at her and he said, well, I think they had one of those conversations that sometimes happens between married couples when one person makes a big decision without consulting the other. <laughs> so if you're struggling to forgive your husband or wife because they, I don't know, they bought a car without asking you, okay, this, this, in this case, they adopted 12 kids. That's, that's a whole other level. Well, a few months later, he'd been off on another international conference speaking, and he came home, and now there were 32 children around the table. <laughs> he looked at his wife, and he said, Gloria, what have you done? This is one of the reasons why he, he hates to travel overseas to speak. <laughs> By the time they'd adopted 62 children, he said to his wife, Gloria, we, we, can't, we can't keep adopting at this rate. Uh, how are we going to look after all these kids? Now they have a dormitory out back with the school. They haven't adopted the children, but they have another 500 they're looking after. Well, a few years ago, some militants broke into their home to kill them. They believed that Ben should be there, and their intelligence was correct, but his flight had been delayed in London, and so he wasn't home. And so when the militants broke into their home, they started torturing his wife, because when she said, he's not here, he's not here, they assumed that she was lying. Eventually, they put a gun in her mouth and pulled the trigger. Ben came home a few hours after that to find his wife lying unconscious in a pool of blood on the floor and rushed her to hospital. She was in, she was in a coma for three months. Now, there are some advantages to being an archbishop in the Church of England, one of which is you get to know the Queen. And so when the Queen of England heard what had happened to them, she rang him and offered them asylum back in the United Kingdom because their lives were now in danger. They, they were being offered, we will relocate you back. And when his wife finally regained consciousness, and they weren't sure if she would, one of the first things Ben said to her is, Gloria, the Queen of England's been in contact. We've been offered asylum to move back to England. And the first words from her mouth were, but Ben, if we leave, who will love all these children? Who will take care of them? And that's why they're still there to this day. When you encounter the love of Christ, it changes everything. It changes every single human heart. I'm a visitor here, so I, I don't know how many of you are here because you're here normally and how many of you here may be visiting today. But I would encourage and invite every single one of you. If you have never encountered the love of Christ, the love of God that is offered to us through the person of Christ, I would urge you, turn to him today. Invite him into your life. He can take the most difficult situation and turn it around. The reason why Jesus Christ can heal every broken heart is because he is love. And when he is poured out into our hearts, we find ourselves in a totally different position before him. And I would urge and invite you. I'd love to make two appeals today if I can. The first would be to every single one of you here who know Jesus Christ. And I'd like to to challenge you afresh and ask you, what is it that's motivating you in your life right now? Is it love for God? Love for people? Love for his things? Is that the primary drive? Are you, or, or are you more interested in looking good than actually being good? What is it that's motivating and driving you? Because when that motivates and drives you, you don't ask your, find yourself asking the question, God, what can I do for you? You, you wake up every morning and you say, Lord, what more can I do? 
What more can I give? What more can I say? What more, what more change would you like to see in me that I may be deeper in this relationship with you? Is there something more that you need to respond to today? On the other side, it's very often to sometimes even think of ourselves as Christians or even be aware that we're not, but be outside of it. It's almost like we're on the outside looking in. Well, this morning, Christ is offering an invitation to you. He knows exactly who you are. He loves you more deeply than you can imagine. And he's holding out a hand today to pull you out of whatever the mess you're in. You know, before I became a Christian, I, I didn't want to become a Christian. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. I wasn't raised in a Christian culture. And I, I never really trusted Christians. I, I, I felt about Christians at that time the same way I felt about communists. They had nothing, but they wanted to share it with me. <laughs> and the, the, basic, the, the basic struggle was, I suppose, I felt very happy in my life. I had a wealthy background, I had the privilege of education, stable family, all kinds of stuff. I had almost every earthly privilege that you can be afforded. And I didn't give myself a mark out of 10, but I think at the time I would have graded myself 8 out of 10. If you said, how well are things going? I said 8, 9. I didn't even have to try to do well at most things I did. I was at school, I, things were easy for me. I didn't have to study to get good grades. I was captain of the chess team, captain of the swimming team, captain of the basketball team. I was captain of the long distance running club, the debating society. I was even captain, the chairman of the environmental society. I mean, and on top of all of that, I was remarkably good looking as you can see and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and amazingly humble for, uh, <laughs> you know, for a young man. So I, I felt everything was going my way. And then I began hearing about Jesus Christ and I met some Christians and I could see the difference in their lives. I could see the difference of love in their hearts. I knew that something had totally captivated and changed them. And I got interested. And I started asking questions and I started asking more questions. And this church here it runs an Alpha course. And if you've never been on an Alpha course, I would encourage you, go to the next one when it starts and bring some friends along. It will utterly transform you. And it was, so it was a bit like that. And after about six months of asking lots of questions, I was away on a camp with these Christians and I suddenly realized that it was true. Everything they'd been telling me was true. That Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had come into this world to save me. It was real. And he wanted me. And the trouble is I didn't want it to be true. I wanted it to be false. And I went up on a mountain to a mountain top. We were camping on a mountain called Mount Olympus and I went near the top of that mountain and I changed, smoked my way through 40 cigarettes. And my, my problem was that I thought becoming a Christian was going to make my life worse. That somehow I'd be less fulfilled, less happy, that all the things I wanted to do that would allow me to experience love, I wouldn't be able to do anymore. And when I got to the end of the 40th cigarette, I don't know how many hours later, I can remember thinking, I, I have to become a Christian. I, I can't deny the truth. And I went and I found some friends of mine who also weren't Christians and I gathered them around into a small group and I said, I need to tell you something. Tonight I'm gonna to become a Christian and you need to know from now on I won't be enjoying myself anymore. <laughs> and that's, that's how I felt inside. I felt that I was sacrificing on the altar of truth, the only, oh, sorry, sacrificing on the altar of happiness, tr you know, the only truth I could know. And so I went off and I found a Christian and I said, will you pray with me? I, I need to know what you're talking about in my heart and life. And they prayed for me. And something remarkable happened. Instead of sinking into depression, which was what I was expecting to happen, <laughs> all of a sudden my heart and life was filled with a love I'd never known. And there was an uncontainable joy that I could barely, I could barely keep within me. Shortly after I became a Christian, my initial plan was to tell no one and keep it secret because I wasn't sure how I'd answer the question. But everybody who met me, first question, they would look at me and they wouldn't say hello. They would look at me and they'd say, Michael, what happened to you? The very first time I was asked that question was 24 hours after I became a Christian. I met this uh, woman. She was 
six foot one, she was a model. She was one of the reasons I didn't want to become a Christian. <laughs> and she took one look at me and she said, Michael, you've changed. What happened to you? And I said, I'm not sure I can, I can do it justice. She said, try. I said, well, I became a Christian yesterday. She said, what does that mean? I said, all I can tell you is I'm a different person to who I was before. She leant forward, looked at me straight in the eyes and said, do you want to sleep with me? And I remember looking at her saying, you know, if you'd asked me 24 hours ago, <laughs> the answer would have been yes. I said, but today the answer is no. And here's the amazing thing. I wasn't disappointed with my answer because I'd come to know a love that was greater than anything I could possibly know through any other human being. And that's the love of God in Christ. And I would invite you, don't, don't miss out on the love that God has for you because you think there's something better. God has the very best for you. In the Bible it says that because God loves us, he disciplines us. We struggle with that word discipline because we imagine someone with a big stick hitting us with it. My father had a stick, he beat me. God has a bigger stick, he can beat me harder. <laughs> but the Greek word the Greek word discipline there, it literally means to put someone in a place so they can function in the way they were always intended to function. That's what God's love for you is. It will put you in the place so you may function in the way you were always intended to. And many of us in this room are malfunctioning today. Not because we need to try harder, but because we have to receive the love that God has for us and then allow that to become the driving force in our life. It's the only thing that's gonna break all these other chains. Miles introduced today by talking about that, that Greek word, it is finished. He reminded all of us how it's a word which when a slave was set free, when he was purchased, redeemed, to be able to set free, to have their freedom, the piece of paper was stamped. It's finished, it's paid, it's done, there's no more, you're now free. Here's the greatest tragedy in this world. Jesus Christ died for every single one of us in this room, but some of, some of us are still living like slaves. Imagine the disappointment to learn that Jesus Christ came into this world, paid to set you free, to take you out of bondage and slavery and put you into true freedom, but you continue to live as a slave. What a, what a tragedy that would be. He's paid for every single one of us. He can change and transform every single heart in this room. And I'm wondering if you could just simply take a moment at this point to ask yourself where you are in response to the love of God. I'm going to offer a brief prayer. Miles is going to come up and then just direct the rest of the time that we have here together. But as we do that, may I ask you, is love informing your life right now? And do you need to say yes to the love of God in your life? Will you pray with me? Father, I want to thank you for your word. But I want to thank you how you challenge every single one of us Lord, so often we excuse a lack of love in our lives by thinking, well, at least we think the right thing or we're doing the right thing or we're worshiping the right thing. But Lord, today you've reminded us that unless love drives and motivates all of this, it is nothing. So Lord, forgive us when we thought that somehow we could enter into your love by doing something on our side. But Lord, instead we thank you that rather you loved us that you gave yourself for us, that you paid the price for us to set us free. And Lord, my prayer is that everyone in this room may know the power of your love in their life and experience it to such an extent that everything that hinders them and every chain that binds them may be broken, that they may come into that true freedom. And we pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.